right? They're rules. So the Microsoft spec is a rule. If you were to spend 15 years of writing a word processor spreadsheet presentation, you should implement all these things. Get started. All right. uh, but there are other rules if you think of the electrical lights here. There are standards related to electricity that not only for convenience say that at least in this country we have one size plug that goes in. And anything you buy can get a Marshall plug into these Plus, right? We also have other <laughs> rules that are related to safety that you may not realize, but in terms of the size of the wires and, and the insulation around the wires. So standards themselves are not concrete. They're just sets of rules or blueprints saying if you ever get around to actually implementing it, you should do these things. So in software interoperability, this usually means the standards are about the format, the way we represent the information. These days, often in XML. The protocols, how we wrap these things. Maybe we deal with the security or reliable messaging of the information that's going back and forth. And then since we have two things at the receiving end, what are the programming interfaces that we actually use? And the more that these are open, the more you can build systems out of different parts and intelligently exchange information. And the more they are closed, so the more I have a bunch of applications, and I don't tell the rest of the world how they talk, the more I expect people to have to buy my application. And that's what software vendors have been classically terrified of. If somehow, if they start sharing data, customers might go somewhere else. Right? This notion of interchangeability. If someone else can write an application similar enough to mine and use my data, they might use that other application. And that's a no-no. So how do you prevent that? How do you stop customers from leaving? <coughs> well, you either lock them in because you have your own data format, either you keep it secret, or else you print out some pages that they don't have a hope of implementing it, right? It's a new strategy. We've got to see it before. Okay. Or here's something. You create a better product. You create a more secure product with better features at a lower price. Customers wouldn't possibly want those features, right? Customers wouldn't possibly choose your product because it's better, faster, more secure, more economical. And that's what's fundamentally starting to change. And we're getting a lot of pressure. And one of the things that's providing a lot of pressure, right, is open source. Because these are frequently the, the these applications, these alternative applications. So just as open standards now are developed by a community, developed and maintained by a community, that is not just one organization or vendor with a vested interest saying it must work my way. Right? People are saying, what, how should this work? Right? Either, yeah, for, for lots of different motivations. Okay, either because they have existing products that they can't advantage the thing to their set of products. Right? Or because from a computer science point of view, it's just the right way to do it. Right? It's the state of the art. So we have these open standards, standards developed in a transparent way. You can see the discussions. Who was at the meeting? What are the minutes? What are the email conversations? Who said what? Transparent. Open. Right? And it's freely available and implementable. Now, freely, I put in quotes because, as you know, there are licenses of various types. It's really not free, free, free. You know, take it to whatever you want and everyone here. But there are licenses, and some of them are very aggressive about uh, making sure that these things will always remain free and so forth. So freely available, let's just leave them closed. And then when we talk about real code, actual open source code, uh, it, it, it is the software. It may and frequently does implement open standards. If you look at some of our products, like WebSphere, which overall is not an open source product right at the top end, however, it contains big chunks of open source. Right? It contains an XML parser which, in fact, we originally gave to Apache about nine years ago, right? And it has evolved quite a bit. But if you look at the open source code that's in our product, it is frequently around implementation of standards, either coming in or going back in, or somehow processing. All right? And again, many times we were involved with, with that trend. And you get the same word to get, so it's being built, right, frequently from the blue screen in a transparent way with community involvement and is both freely available. And you would have Richard Solomon argue one sense of what free means and maybe you have other people on other ends of open source licenses arguing, well, you know, it's less free or more free or whatever. We won't get into that. 
But the, the words here that are really important, okay, are transparency, community, okay, and then some notion of freedom. Without getting too much into that. Now, when it comes to this notion of innovation, and it's not fun talking at a university about this. Um, so, how do we sum up innovation? Okay, innovation is good. Let's have more of it. What more do you have to say? Right? So there is, if you're in uh, uh, a university, so you know, I think back when I was in grad school. So uh, I was there, well, I was there two pieces. So it was 12 years from beginning to end, but my excuse is I was away for five and a half years in the middle. But there was one Thursday where my thesis advisor said, and you will be done on Monday. <coughs> okay? So that is, that's forced innovation. I had, you know, X number of lemons and corollaries to do. And, and finish by Monday, which miraculously we managed to do. Okay, but where do good ideas come from? Are they like that where they are forced, or do you create an environment from them? And by the way, you know, they're not always technical. I think a lot of people in the computer industry think of technical innovation. But in fact, a lot of what's happened over the last few years has been legal innovation. I mean, dealing with things like open source, understanding what GPL v3 really will and won't mean. And the Free Software Foundation has had a lot of you know, time thinking about what, what that actually means. Um, all sorts of notions. We did a patent place at the beginning of 2005 for 500 patents for open source. There were things by the time we got to October and did another pledge for standards for healthcare and education that the legal community had changed their minds on and how they needed to phrase it. And they're constantly thinking of doing that. Right? So they are running to keep track of this notion, and they are then feeding back their ideas, because they can't think rather theoretically about these issues, feeding back and saying, well, the next time you're going to do something on the IT side, this is the way we want to structure it, because we think this will accomplish your goals better. Right? So there's, there's uh, the legal side. Um, is, is Linux innovative? Well, you know, classic wars there. You know, well, they're just copying units, or they're just copying Windows, or whatever. Things like this. I, I think everybody can find something in Linux that's new and different and wonderful, right? Um, that's, that's okay, um, and that's good. But has Linux been innovative in the marketplace? Well, IBM would say several billion dollars of revenue 